but there's good news. <laughs> um, the research says, and when I was given this role as a wellness counselor, I went, wait a minute, I don't have the right letters after my name, although I've been doing crisis counseling for 25 years, I can't, I'm not a diet, I don't diagnose, um, but after reading all these books about depression and anxiety and self-mutilation and suicide, I find a theme that comes through and it's kind of these five areas. To mitigate the effects of these adverse childhood experiences, you have to teach a kid how to sleep properly. It sounds so simple, but our kids are incredibly sleep deprived. Where can we teach them that? In the health curriculum. That should be in there about how important it is and what happens to the brain when you don't sleep and how it affects you later on. Proper nutrition. You got to put gasoline in the car or it doesn't run. And our kids have terrible diets. So, I, you know, and don't get me wrong. I like pizza and ice cream just like everybody else does. But I also pay attention to what I put in there to make sure the machine is running properly. Regular exercise. Who can take care of that? The PE curriculum should be doing more than just getting them out and running them around the track, but to teach them why. Why is that important and what parts of the body does it affect, including your brain and your central nervous system? So we have to teach them what our school's for. Let's teach them more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. Healthy relationships is part of, of mental health, and we have to teach kids how to have healthy relationships. There's kids that go home and they say, okay, I'm going to scream for the next eight hours until I go to sleep, and then I'll get up and have a fight with my mom, and then I'll go to school. And then I'm going to sit in pre-cal class and learn pre-cal? I don't think you are. So we have to teach our kids about what a healthy relationship entails. And then mindful meditation seemed to be the fifth pillar of this healthful uh, thing. And that is what we're trying to do here at Valley High School, is teach them mindful meditation. How many kids go inside and have a healthy conversation with themselves about who they are and how they want this story to turn out. I don't know if they ever take the time to do that, but if they can learn to stay in the moment and have a conversation with themselves, they can set personal goals. So in 25 years of doing this, I, I, I've never had to teach a kid right from wrong. They all know, but are, do they have the strength to do it? How often do they look inside and examine their own belief system? Um, where are they going to learn the importance of having an inner dialogue? Um, they know what a good person is and a bad person is. When are they going to reinforce those ideas? Um, do they know how to deal with time, past, future, and present time, and what they mean? I mean, I ask kids all the time, oh, that happened to you? How many times have you thought about going back and changing that? And when you did, how do, do they know how to deal with time and to think about time properly so it doesn't cause depression or anxiety? And, and how do they learn to cope with what they feel and to build resilience? So I was worried about those questions. And this is what their brains look like. Um, and we've got to somehow calm down that, that fight or flight instinct that they have. Now, Knowing and being aware of your surroundings and all that stuff has kept us alive as human beings. And that's an important part, but there's more. And they don't develop the more when they're constantly in fight or flight mode. So I had some objections from the staff when I presented it to them that there was no data. Well, I found hundreds and thousands of research papers done now on mindfulness meditation and what it does to the brain. So there's a lot of data out there. So I presented them with the data. They said it's a waste of time. I only have so many teaching minutes and I'm not going to give them up to a kid asking my kids to close their eyes and think about things. Well, Data has shown and research has shown that you actually save time if your kids are focused and not worried about the fight with their mom this morning and have come to terms with it. It actually saves you time in the classroom if your kids come in and focus. And it also saves time if the teacher is focused as well.
And then some people feel that it has some kind of religious uh, meaning to do mindfulness meditation. Well, there's people that have done it for thousands of years across the board. Some people call it prayer and some people call it meditation and you can call it whatever you want, but you need to go inside and have this inner dialogue and it has nothing to do with it. I'm not selling religion. Uh, so the data, you know, 19,000 uh, meditation studies done by John Hopkins, Massachusetts General says it does this, it, it quells anxiety and improves sleep and your irritability. Harvard, it finds that it, it grows the hippocampus, which is important for learning, memory, self-awareness. And the Mayo Clinic says that it does all these things. So I think those are some of the bigger names that people might recognize, but there's been all kinds of research that shows that this actually works. All we got to do is put it into our schools. So there's all kinds of data to support the positive results of mindfulness in the classroom. And this is just a partial list of some of the things. And, it, and I like the last one that it actually helps you physically with eating disorders, ADHD. Boy, do we have that diagnosed all over the place. Uh, heart disease, but uh, managing pain, encouraging compassion, uh, generates gratitude. Uh, keeps you from flying off the handle uh, with your, uh, your anger issues. So there's a lot of research that shows that there's positive results that come from mindfulness meditation. And so, um, and it also helps the practitioner. The people that are doing this also see some positive results from mindful meditation and just asking others and training others to do it. So, it's a powerful, a purposeful use of time. It grows the hippocampus, which teachers need kids to do so that they can learn or remember stuff. It lowers the stress and anxiety level in the room. It improves their attention and focus. They don't get tired as easy and want to go hang out in the bathroom. Uh, it increases their confidence and it regulates their emotions. Um, some common negative responses, again, the religious connection. Uh, effects can't be accurately measured. Oh, there's thousands and thousands of, of research that has been done. And that ACES done test that was done by the CDC has been replicated in many different uh, socioeconomic levels and the results come out the same. So it has nothing to do with with the, their poverty levels it actually does has to do with their adverse childhood experiences. Um, it trains, it says, it trains children to be peaceful and passive in accept, acceptance of hardship. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. Uh, it brings feelings of ennui, emptiness and fear. Uh, they take calmness for that. Uh, it's practiced by contemporary hippies. I kind of like that one. I like being called names. And, uh, and it can lead to your demons. And that's that trigger them thing. I want to trigger them at 13 and 14 years old instead of waiting to hear that they have died at 40 years old and they never quite got to where they needed to go. And they weren't able to help their children get to where they need to go. So it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that we need to stop fulfilling. So I, I make sure I keep it secular and I have had not one complaint from one parent about this. Um, it's, uh, it's reasonable to affirm humanistic values like kindness and compassion and generosity and all those things. I do it in the primary instructional language. Um, I don't tell kids how to feel. They get to feel exactly how they feel. That's the beauty of it. I want them to be, to be able to verbalize that. That's the beauty of it. I don't put any religious symbols in it or clang a gong or use foreign languages or anything like that. And uh, I'm consistent with current scientific understandings of biology. I don't say it does anything more than stimulate your central nervous system in a certain way. And, and it's a subjective experience. Everybody experiences it differently. That's cool. Just be in the moment. 